Um, I'm going to take a departure from our typical verse by verse study through the Bible and instead share a topical. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, Mary and I have been under the weather for two weeks. Uh, and my sermon prep time has been spent trying to stay awake a lot. It's just the weariness from this uh, sickness is just, uh, I, I thought it was just because I'm an old guy. <laughs> and I'm sure that plays into it. But, um, but more than that, we're just weary from a lot of things here. And also, as I began seeking the Lord for the next chapter in John, which is John 15, great chapter, which I, I'm really looking forward to us studying. next. We'll start next week, Lord willing. As I began seeking the Lord about whether or not to actually make this detour today, he led me to a topic that is very relevant, uh, relevant excuse me, given the kind of environment in which we live here in Philly. Um in our nation and what is likely to occur regardless uh, of the verdict in the George Floyd murder trial over the next few days or maybe longer I'm not sure so today I want to talk to you about brotherly love and if you look at that PowerPoint that's why I asked you to turn to Romans chapter 12 Romans chapter 12 verse 10 tells us be kindly affectioned one an to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Um, it seems that everybody here in attendance knows me. That we don't have any strangers here today. No stranger than we are anyway. And when you think I, I, a little bit about me, the, you know, I'm the pastor here at Calvary Kings Highway. I'm the chaplain at St. Christopher's <coughs> Hospital for Children been married almost 47 wonderful years and the father of four great kids grandfather of four soon to be six beloved grandchildren so when the lord led me to this topic it, i was nervous because brotherly love is a tough subject and in our warm typical warm weather neighborhood environment here in philly uh, bill across the street bill Walls, who's here with us today um he can attest to this many philadelphia residents including me uh the brotherly love is not greatly evident so i had to take stock of my own heart in fact i'm sure it was my repenting of a hard heart last week that the lord used to bring up this topic and so we start with romans 12 10. this is the basics for christianity brotherly love is a command it's not a suggestion be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. Now that's St. Paul who wrote that, not Jesus, but still, it's the scriptures, it's God's word. <clears throat> Jesus himself said in John chapter 13, verse 34, and that's the next slide you should see if I do my job correctly. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And we just studied that. Jesus was had washed the apostles' feet, and things were coming close to the end of his earthly life. And although he didn't use the word or phrase brotherly love in this um, segment of Scripture, this is what he meant. And I say that because once we accept the Lord as our Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're spiritual kin, if you will. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11 tells us, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brothers or brethren. In Even in uh, Ephesians, and, and maybe I didn't put that one up, so I'll just read it to you, figures. Um chapter 2 verse 19 now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of god that's ephesians chapter 2 verse 19. in the book of romans paul writes again the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god and in matthew jesus own words whosoever shall do the will of my father which is in heaven the same as my brother and sister 
and mother. So there's this family of God to which we now belong, <clears throat> and trying to figure out our place in it is, is important on an individual level. So where the word agape is the Greek word used by Jesus in John chapter 13, verse 34, uh, not Philadelphia, which we all know means the city of brotherly love, ha ha. He used that phrase to elevate the type of love humans should show one to another to an entirely unworldly level by focusing the attention of Christians on expressing to each other the highest type of love that exists, which is agape or other centered love. That's a bit off track. <clears throat> so we get back to Philadelphia and the city of brotherly love, which is, uh, it's not, Philadelphia is not our topic, the city that is. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. At least that's the most widely known piece of uh, cultural history about our city. It used to be, but from where I sit in Philadelphia, that would be laughable if the atmosphere of our city wasn't so sad the opposite from the meaning of its name. I only wish it would live up to its name. But cities don't live. People do. So until the city, the people of Philadelphia begin exhibiting brotherly love, the city of Philadelphia won't truly be the city of brotherly love. And yet, we as Christians cannot expect that level of behavior from people who don't have the resources of heaven at their disposal. As Christians, though, we are equipped with those heavenly resources, which is a great thing. And before you think I'm about to teach some kind of social gospel message here, trust me, I'm not. Please bear with me. Um, let me see if I've got 1 John up here for you guys. Yes, look at 1 John chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. This is written by the gospel writer John. He was an old man when he wrote this epistle. And this is what he says, In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Those are some powerful words. What the Holy Spirit had John the Apostle writer say here is that there's a clear distinction between God's children and those of the devil. God's children do righteously, according to God's standards, and exhibit brotherly love. Those who are children of the devil do not. An old uh, preacher, J. Vernon McGee, once said, and I quote, I think we need a little more manifesting today because many of the children of God look like they belong to somebody else. And that's so true. And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody but in the mirror. Peter wrote something about it. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. He has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature. The divine nature that we share in that? We as believers in the Lord have the nature of God himself in us. We are partakers of the divine nature. You know, one of the weirdest moments in life when we had our kids, and you all probably went through something similar, is when you're talking and correcting or teaching or arguing with your own children, all of a sudden you hear your own mother's or father's voice coming out of your mouth. And when you start saying things that you swore you would never, never, ever say to your own children, and here it is, you're doing it. And it's in those times we suddenly realize that we have become our parents. Not exactly, but it's inevitable. Our heritage has a real distinct reflection on who we are and what we become. Now, there are probably at least a few characteristics of our earthly parents that we never want to reflect. We'll spend a lot of effort and energy in order to overcome those things, but there will always be a birthmark of sorts that links us back to them. 
It's the same with our becoming part of God's family. There will always be a birthmark of sorts that links us back to the one to whom we now belong. The old adage, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, is repeated often because it's true that parents do have a great influence over their children to the point where the children exhibit some of the behaviors and characteristics of the parents. Now, we, we've been studying through the Gospel of John, and we've seen some behavior amongst religious leaders in the first century towards Jesus that are befuddling, to say the least. We're being kind here. The religious leaders of Jesus' time, the scribes, the Pharisees, the priests, the Sadducees, everybody there, they certainly would not have classified themselves as children of the devil. Well, look what John just wrote for us here. We just read it. That um, there's going to be times when it's going to be evident that we as children of God exhibit brotherly love, that we do righteousness, but the children of the devil do not. And if we use that word of God as a template to lay over what we've just read in the Gospel of John, we see the Pharisees completely different than they see themselves. Those religious leaders would not have classified themselves as children of the devil. They saw themselves as children of Abraham, the children of God. And yet Jesus spoke to them and said that by their very behavior, it was evident that their father was the devil. They had a big argument about it. Jesus wasn't really upset. I'm sure he was sad for them, but they were really angry. I... You know, I wrestle with this at times in my life, and I suspect you have times too, when all of a sudden you're thinking, holy mackerel, where's the love of God in me towards people? Now, I bring it up because last Saturday was one of those warm nights in Philly. Windows were not open yet. It was still warm, though. It was nice. And on warm nights here in the Philadelphia area, and if you live in another city, maybe it's not that way. Apparently, some of our neighbors believe that the music they play is enjoyable to everyone within a four block radius. Now, for you country folk, that's like a half a mile or about 880 yards. And when it's the end of a long week, and most of the block, people on the block simply want to relax a bit and get some sleep on a Saturday night, watch a little TV, the volume of the music and other things going on assaults us sometimes till far past midnight. Even with the windows and doors closed, it's almost impossible to hear your own television, let alone to have a quiet moment and try to study and, and think about the Lord. And at those times, if you're not feeling well or want to do some quiet study, forget about it, right? Well, what does this have to do with brotherly love? Why should we exhibit brotherly love? Because we should want to. If we have been born again in our hearts, our hearts will yearn to do good for people, even when our flesh wants to do otherwise. Do I feel brotherly love towards those loud, noisy neighbors? Let me just say this. Brotherly love is not the first emotion that arises within me. I confess that ashamedly. It's human, but it's the way I feel. And I don't like that I feel human at times. The question then becomes, how? How? How can I show brotherly love when I'm struggling to even feel nice? And no, not getting even isn't showing brotherly love. Uh, restraining myself is not showing brotherly love. It, in my mind it might be, but that's not what the Lord is talking about here. Well, how do I do it? That's the question. Let's go back to Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verses 1 through 3. See, before I can exhibit brotherly love, I've got to lay some things aside that are in my way. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Ouch. Ouch. As Christians, we have tasted the grace of God. He is gracious. He forgave our sins. When he drew our hearts and we were all excited and didn't even know what to call it, when we knew he was leading us somewhere we'd never been led before, but 
yet it resonated so deeply in our spirits. It's something we always longed for. He was gracious to call us from where we were to where we are today. So yes, and having tasted the graciousness of the Lord, Peter tells us to lay aside all these items, malice, deceit. <clears throat> the men of Jesus' day wore long robes. And if on a cold night someone got too close to a fire while trying to get warm, uh, and his robe suddenly caught fire, what would he do? Would he stop, drop, and roll? No. He may probably did that. But first things first, he would strip off his robe and, and throw it off. Folks, there are some things we just need to lay aside. Malice. That, that's a Greek word. The underlying Greek means any kind of wickedness. The willingness to break laws is one of its meanings. <laughs> when I look around the city, I look around the world today, when I look around our nation, over the past four years, especially, I see a lot of people with malice. This word means a deep-seated hatred of others that stems from a basic selfishness. And here, it's not being used to the world. It's said to you Christians, Peter's writing, you need to lay this aside from your own hearts. Guile, deceit, clever or tricky practices, Deceive, catch something with bait. That's what the word means. <clears throat> You're guilty of this when you misquote someone in order to hurt them or make misleading statements. I don't have to tell you what it is. You know what it is. Hypocrisy, acting uh, with two faces. In fact, the Greek actors um, use this word to describe their own trade. Two-facedness. They held that Greek masks up. You've seen the symbols of of acting, tragedy, and comedy, they would hold a, hold a mask, old-fashioned actors in those days, with two faces, one on one side, one on the other, so you would know what they were trying to portray. Do you really need examples of hypocrisy? We just have to look around the world, but we have to look in our hearts, is what Peter is saying here. And envy, the green-eyed monster, as it's called. Even the twelve apostles exhibited envy. As Jesus is nearing death, they're arguing about their future positions in his coming kingdom. Amazing. One of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not covet, because as Paul writes for us in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 5, covetousness is idolatry. That's why. And idolatry is a sin against God. It's putting something else on the throne of your heart. You desire something God doesn't want for you. Peter's list includes all evil speaking, which is defamation, backbiting, which includes gossip. But that's only the start. Once we have stopped doing those things and laying those things aside, he exhorts us that there are other things we should begin to do. Desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. The sincere milk of the word. One thing about all this is notice none of these things have to do how, with how anyone else treats me. They are all internal within me. I am the first barrier to my having brotherly love. Desire the sincere, pure milk of the word. A lot of homes today are missing the milk of God's word. I don't care what you hear in these um, historical revisionist schools our kids are sadly being led to, both in college and lower grades, and in the press. When God's word was the good book in most people's homes, whether or not they were all born again, I can't speak to. But they trusted God's word, and they read it, and it guided their lives. Now, did they follow it perfectly? Who does? Even we as Christians don't do that. But when that was happening, as bad as some things were in our nation, for the most part, this was a safer nation in which to live. I think the lack of the sincere milk of God's word might be the biggest reason we have a lack of brotherly love, not just in America, but globally. 
And I know some will think it can't be that simple. Well, actually, it can be that simple. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The word sanctify in this verse speaks of the process of purifying that goes on in the hearts of people who have been born again by the Spirit of God in us. We don't become perfect overnight. We become, we are accepted as perfect in God's sight from a judgmental perspective. Jesus paid for our sins so we won't go to judgment on that but in the actual practical outworking on earth we don't go from step one to step 27 without taking 26 steps in between god purifies us as we allow him by the way he's willing to do it quickly if we let him but let me just say this once you get a taste for the soul refreshing water of god's word you will never want to turn away from it now, Peter said things plural, or I said things plural, we should begin to do. God will make, and I say that um, God will make those things clear to you as you read and study his word, because we all have different weaknesses and things that we need to lay aside. Now, what I don't want to do, let me stop with this word study for a second. <clears throat> I, we don't want an, to do an academic word study of brotherly love through the scriptures. That would be helpful, but what good would it be if we don't learn how to actually have and practically live out brotherly love? We'd be wasting our time. We'd be filling our heads with knowledge and our hearts would still be in the same shape. At the same, by the same token, neither do we want to wander away from the scriptures even a small bit because as 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tell us, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so we stick to the scriptures for that washing, that perfecting, that sanctification. So we will look at what the scriptures say then, and then we will do our best to understand their practical application to us wherever we live in society, in whatever nation or culture we might live. Now, in its most basic form, brotherly love is the outworking of God's love for man through us. And if you put it in terms like that, that's awesome and frightening. The outworking of God's love for other people through you and me. Who am I to do that when I don't even feel it at times? You know, on Saturday nights, I have thought, you know what, if I just took an axe to the... Uh, main line that's attached to the side of the house from the, the electric company that'll shut off the electricity they won't have any air conditioning or noise I've had crazy thoughts i would never do that but i think it like okay, why where's that thought come from i'll probably get shocked if i swung an axe through that cable right but there you go the old flesh just jumps to the forefront how can i live this love out that god wants to share with them when i'm feeling that way jesus said it Love your neighbor as yourself. I love myself too much to swing that axe, let me tell you. In his letter to Timothy, Paul tells us that believers should treat older men and women, uh, older men as fathers uh, and mothers, older men and women, younger women and younger men as brothers and sisters. This is the family of God. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, with all purity. <clears throat> not for hitting on people, not for trying to be friendly, not with ulterior motives to get close to people so what you can get out of it. And this is done in many practical ways through brotherly love. And brotherly love is the practical outworking of agape love. They're not apart. And agape love is other-centered. It puts the needs of others ahead of our own needs. Agape includes proper attitudes as well as behavior, even towards rude neighbors. You know, the world yearns for agape love. 
we know this because of their use. How many times have you been to a wedding and heard the love chapter? Love is patient. Love is kind. You've heard that's First Corinthians chapter thirteen. I have a wedding with that stuff printed on it for when I do weddings. Then I get asked to do weddings, and that's something that most brides and grooms want to hear a portion of that scripture. Now Jesus knew that people would resonate with that sort of love, not just. Any people, all people, all, not specific people, everybody. After all, this is what we were created to live and express before sin entered the world and mankind fell to living on a lower earthly plane. I've posted it already up there. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11. He has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God makes from the beginning to the end. It is part of the eternity God has placed in our hearts of man. Let me explain. The, word, the, the words the world here in this verse is the Hebrew word olam. 412 times it is translated in the Bible as ever, everlasting, perpetual, evermore, ancient, always. It's got to do with eternity. Only four times is it translated world, as you see here. God has placed eternity in our hearts. It's an awareness in mankind and a longing for eternal things. Hence the plethora of religions and spiritualities that people try to express and get into. This longing for the eternal that God has placed in our hearts. There was a poet called The Irishman, written by an Irish poet back in the 1700s. And in it, and I won't quote it directly, uh, but this is what he says in one of the phrases. The savage heart beats for its native shore. Now, he's talking on an earthly plane. But you know what, folks? We were created in the image of God. We were created from heaven. And our hearts beat for home. God has put eternity in our hearts. Everybody out there. I don't care who they are, how drugged up they might be and messed up they might be now. When they were created by our loving God, this was built into them just like it's built into you and I. They haven't all heard his voice and someday they might. And they might respond positively. They're longing for this. This is because they don't get it. This emptiness, this feeling of emptiness because of the lack of agape love in human hearts. Because our hearts do beat for a place where we do not live. The, the lack of getting that emptiness filled by all the things we try to fill it with. Experiences, relationships, uh, drugs, buying things, money, whatever it is people try to fill that void in their hearts with. Which can only be filled by Jesus, by God himself. God is love. It's the fact that they've gone so many years without that and being a treated poorly by other people at times that makes their brains crazy that makes their hearts go crazy that makes them tough and go nutty it's sin yes it's all sin i'm not blaming it on the people around them don't get me wrong they've not sought the one who can fill the void and when presented with them they reject him the point is there's a reason why people are going wild out there and it's because they're without christ that has never changed god is love God is love. Fran isn't love. None of us are love. Now remember, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Since agape love is a characteristic of God our Father, it is something that should at some point be seen in us as his children. Paul writes for us, Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. i got to honestly admit, I don't feel that from time to time. I don't feel it a lot. We learn from the scripture that as believers, we do have agape love in our hearts. <coughs> Paul wrote it for us right here. However, we often have too much of our fleshly selves covering that agape so it can't get out. We can't even feel it, let alone others see it. Therefore, we must remove whatever it is that's hiding it. What does that entail? Laying aside first the things that Peter wrote about. 
And once we've laid aside these barriers to expressing the agape love that has been a shed abroad in our hearts, we must grow in our faith, which only happens by reading and studying God's word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And once that faith begins to grow, you'll take the bold steps of loving when you feel like giving somebody a, 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 a knuckle on their head. Without spiritual growth, the expression of our agape love will be immature at best, if at all. Earlier I said that some might think it, it can't be that simple, but it is that simple. If we give ourselves over to practicing the instruction in righteousness found in Scripture, we will find, as we've been reading through the Gospel of John, how obedience leads us into um, spiritual growth also. We have to practice it. Those who have practiced any kind of physical uh, activity, <clears throat> any kind of craft, any kind of the martial arts, the more you practice, the better at it you get with good instruction. Here's the best instruction right here. Instruction in righteousness. You want to be loving? Do what God, who is the author of love, God is love. Do what he says to do. The best instructor in the world. After watching the past two presidential campaigns, I can say that I'm tired of the lack of brotherly love in the world. When I saw the hatred spewing across the television screen or heard it blaring from my radio, especially in our latest presidential contest between two people who want to be in charge of the most prosperous and powerful nation in the history of mankind, I am tired of the lack of brotherly love in the world. When I read the news about man's inhumanity to man, whether it comes from religious cults that cuts heads off of people or from an alleged human rights group, groups that encourage the killing of police officers, or from rogue police officers who in their hatred abuse their authority and power to kill others, I am tired of the lack of brotherly love in the world. As I sit in my living room in the Philadelphia summers, and against my will am forced to hear my neighbors fighting in the street or arguing in their living rooms so loudly that I can hear them inside my own home, even with my doors and windows shut, especially with the limited vocabulary which anger brings to their tongues, I am tired of the lack of brotherly love in the world. And I cannot simply laugh it off saying, people are sinners, therefore they sin. Though this is true, it's not a laughing matter. I am tired of the lack of brotherly love in the world. And I'm tired for many reasons. <clears throat> it vexes my soul. It undermines my hope in common decency. Don't know why I ever had that. <laughs> At my age, the lack of love in the world causes my heart to sink because even though I've raised my children to love Christ and function in a fallen world, I have learned that it was not enough to protect them from the pains and struggles that come as a result of the lack of godly love in this world, the pain of which came both from people of the world and people within the church. I am tired of the lack of brotherly love in the world. But I am called to express something greater, agape love. That the world lacks agape love only underscores the truth of God's word, which tells us that agape love exists only in those who are born of God's spirit. It also reminds me that things will not get better or fixed until Jesus returns. But this underscoring of God's word concerning the lack of agape love in the world also brings me hope. Because God's word also tells us that Jesus will return and that he will straighten things out. So what can I do in the meantime? Do I keep my doors and windows closed and pray? Well, praying is always the right thing to do. But faith without works is dead. 
so I cannot sit cloistered in my living room? Do I get passionately angry with a fire burning in my belly like when I was a young man and then redirect that passionate energy as an old guy into doing good social works in order to help alleviate the pain and suffering caused by this lack of love in the world? Well, doing good for others is always a, the right thing to do. But good works without faith are of no lasting help. Do I strive to affect effect social change by supporting good political candidates? Do I petition the government in my spare time in order to correct the unfair and unjust laws in our country that protect those who do inhumane things to other human beings? Doing what I can to make my culture better is always right, especially if I have the freedom to speak up and vote for change. <coughs> and then I remember what Jesus read said to us in the Bible in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Though God's word tells me to respect and pray for those in political authority, nowhere does his word tell me to fix the government. But his word does tell me to love with agape love. So the onus of expressing agape love in the world is placed squarely on my shoulders, on your shoulders. Therefore, if I see a lack of agape love in my little piece of the world, the responsibility for bringing it is mine and mine alone. I am tired of the lack of godly love in the world, and so I will bring it to them. Let's pray.